virtual meeting through Microsoft Teams of the Health and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Panel. Um, say at the outset a special welcome to uh, Councillor Phil Cole and Councillor Laney Ball who Laney Mayball who joined uh, this panel and also express my thanks to Councillors George Dirks and John Gilliver who um, have contributed to the panel over the last three years and uh, have now moved on to, uh, to to join other panels. Councillor Gilliver indeed promoted to Vice Chair of um, Children and Young People so we, we we wish them well in their work on uh, on those panels. Um, this morning, uh, the it is possible that uh, Mr. George Tors, a member of the public, would be joining us, but he isn't here with us, is he, Caroline? No, no, he's not coming to the meeting yet. OK, um, so the first thing then is for each of us to go around and introduce ourselves. Um, on my screen, I have Pat in my top left hand corner. So I don't know if that's the same for everyone, is it? No, probably, probably no. not. <laughs> not. OK, Pat, please, uh, please start. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Councillor Pat Hayes from Roman Ridge Ward. Thank you. Laney? Hi, everybody. I'm Councillor Laney Ball from Conisbury and Denneby Ward. Thank you. Martin? Uh, good morning, I'm uh, uh, Councillor Martin Greenhouse, Ticket on Wadworth Ward. Thank you. Was that me? Sorry, and um, sorry, Chair. So I'm, I'm Phil Holmes, I'm the Director of Adults Health and Wellbeing in the Council. Thank you. Phil Cole, you're on mute. Phil, you were muted when you introduced yourself. Phil Cole was muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we Great. can First hear you first recording. Uh, yeah, Phil Cole, Councillor for Edlington and Wormsworth Ward. Thank you. Debbie. Morning. I'm Debbie John Lewis. I'm the Assistant Director for Communities. Thank you. Welcome. Caroline. Caroline saying hi okay thank you and we have Rachel Wright with us who's um, taking the notes of this meeting thank you so we have um, apologies this morning from councillors Cynthia Ransom Rachel Hodson sorry my screen my screens that I'm reading from is frozen um, and uh, Sean Gibbons, uh, we're not expecting to attend. Um, just need to read you this housekeeping announcement. It's slightly different to the one that we normally read out where we ask you about congregating outside the um, the civic office. Uh, this morning we are saying if someone wishes to speak, we ask that they use the raise hand function on Microsoft Teams. Uh, we'll go round. We have a question plan, so I will introduce each person to ask their uh, respective question and to cut out background noise. Can mobiles please be put on silent and Microsoft chat not be used and microphones muted unless you're asked to speak, which I know you have all been doing. Uh, the meeting is to be recorded and will be available to view on the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, we don't have any members of the public um, who have joined us. And then one final point, if anyone who is participating in the meeting or listening to the debate is disconnected, officers will inform me as chair when this becomes apparent. Please <coughs> rejoin the meeting as you originally joined and the officers will ensure you are reconnected. Thank you. Um, if anyone has a declaration of interest to make, uh, please contact Caroline Martin who can assist you in making that declaration. We need to uh, approve the minutes of our overview and scrutiny panel held on the 6th of August 2020. Uh, can we accept those as a true and accurate record? Could you just raise your hand if you were there and you agree they can be accepted as a true and accurate record? Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, we have no public statements. And so that takes us into our first substantial agenda item of the morning, which is access to day support and short breaks during the COVID-19 pandemic, pages 19. 22 of our uh, agenda pack. So I'm going to give Debbie just the opportunity to introduce this item and then Debbie we have lots of questions for you. Thank you. Okay thank you. Um, so um, I uh, want to talk about firstly uh, just to set some context obviously um, assuming that you've read the report um, but just to add the context around the day services um, currently, we support 384 people in, in the day services and we operate from 13 locations across the borough. So uh, that includes one location, which is our gardening service known as ACE. So it's quite a, quite a large service. The people who access the service are adults with learning disabilities or autism and also older older people. So it's a it's a mix of, of people that we, we support. Um, access to those services is through a Care Act assessment. So people who use the services have been through a Care Act assessment and are eligible, uh, have an eligible identified need. And part of that support is through uh, through our services. Um, so, in, in essence, the um, people who use services are well known to adult social care as well as, uh, as the provider, um, which is, is ourselves. Um, I think it's um, to note for this particular paper that a lot of the people who use our day services also use our respite services that we're talking about in the paper as well. So it, it is sort of very much a, a sort of collaborative um, across the board, really. So it sits hand in hand. Um, the report does point out in the early days, we, we did have to activate our business continuity plan back in March. Um, again, um, within that, um, we, we did communicate quite strongly with individuals and families. Um, and at the time, at the onset of the uh, COVID pandemic, um, lots of people at the early weeks in March had stopped attending anyway because there was fear and risk around, around um, individuals attending. Bearing in mind the cohort of people that we support have got, many have got complex health conditions and the risks for some of those people were higher than, than you know, in terms of their, their risk to um, contracting COVID. So they, you know, we did start to see a real drop off anyway in the weeks um, before we, we closed the day services down. So the decision was taken on the 23rd um, of March to close the, the centres and um, we did do in collaboration with our community adult learning disability team, we did joint risk assessments on all of the individuals that, um, that use our services and that, that really um, took into account their health risk, um, the risk um, around behaviours, them remaining at home, the um, this home situation around whether they were living with an older carer um, and, and a combination of things. So everybody had a risk assessment at the very onset. And um, we um, when we closed the services, we very quickly mobilised into having a regular contact with each individual. And that was done um, through various means from uh, regular phone calls, some virtual sessions which were done in groups and also um, some WhatsApp sessions. Throughout the period of the lockdown, um, some individuals um, took it upon themselves to do lots of charity raising money for different things. One of them being that they raised money for activity packs for all the individuals. So staff did go out and deliver some um, activity packs for individuals as, as well. Um, so staying connected was a big theme because um, that again, we recognise the risk associated with people losing contact with friendship groups, becoming isolated. Um, so that was um, sort of something that we, we really did um, focus on. In terms of um, those risk assessments, they were continually monitored and where individuals were presenting with an increased risk or a change in their circumstances, then joint meetings were happening on a weekly basis with the um, social work teams to review those individuals and to look at whether they needed 
further support and um, so that was something that was ongoing throughout and is still continuing not for everybody on a weekly basis but that process is still continuing around the day services so very much at that time we were working within the guidance that was coming out nationally and through public health taking advice around how we we should uh, and also on a regional basis we were in touch with rotherham sheffield barnsley around how they were monitoring and managing their services and we were very much doing the same uh, the same at that period um, as things started to uh, sort of improve, we did start to look at reopening our services um, in June. So we started to prepare how we could start to reopen in in um, in regards to that. So um, as part of that, we we did do again uh, the council from a corporate perspective as well as the national guidance quickly pulled together a framework um, to ensure that any any buildings that were reopened um, had to go through a rigorous risk assessment process and a sign off. So we very quickly engaged with facilities management and our, um, we don't own all the, all the buildings that we operate. So the landlords from those buildings, as well as our corporate health and safety ensuring that the uh, restrictions were adhered to and the um, measures were put into place. Again, this was very much around focusing on our primary concern was the safety of the of the individuals and our staff. So we were very, very clear about that. And, and we took that with obviously very cautiously. Um, Again, um, we, we developed a joint eligibility criteria to uh, agree and uh, identify who needed to come back into the, into the building. Because what we recognised, as you know, with schools, we've had to look at um, how, how we work in small bubbles. So this was before the regulation around six. Even before then, we had to look at how we could work safely. So what we did is the criteria allowed us to identify those that more at risk, those who lived with older carers, those who had less networks around them at home, those who had started to have um, mental health um, escalations. Um, so we were able to focus on those at, at most risk to come back in first. Originally, the regulation said that the staff who work with the um, a small bubble of people had to remain with only one bubble. So we couldn't actually um, have different bubbles with the same staff at different days. It had to be the same. But just recently in September, that that is sort of um, lessened now. So on a, on different days, staff can work with different um, bubbles of individuals. So. Um, what we have been able to do with the criteria and an application of the work we're doing with our adult disability team is to be able to meet the demand of those who need to come into a building base um, at the moment. But again, um, at the minute, not all our centres are open. We have still got four centres that are not open due to some of the not being able to um, adhere to the restrictions that we need, the measures, sorry, that we need to have in place around safety. Some of that is that some of the buildings need some modification and one of the buildings may not be suitable. So um, we are having to work around that. And throughout that period, we have been um, communicating with families, individuals through a regular newsletter, but also um, individual correspondence and the phone calls are, con are continuing. So um, at present, we've got um, at the time of the report, they have had 70 individuals accessing a, a, a building base. But as I say, we are continuing with the other. Um, that is increasing from next week because we are introducing more bubbles into some of the centres. So we hope that that will increase to about 110 people. It's important to note as well that um, 110 people um, live in supported living, so they have a strong network around them and the providers of those services have been continuing to provide day opportunities within their, their own environment. So um, we haven't given priority to those individuals at this moment in time because it was felt that they they were um, able to access um, support um, and remain connected to, to friends. 
So in terms of our short break service, um, as, as I was reiterating, a lot of the people do use the short breaks who use day services. But again, very quickly at the same time in March, we, we activated our business continuity plan. Um, we identified um, at that point, um, always identified from the onset, the, the role that respite plays in terms of the vital support that that gives to carers. And we recognise the challenges were increasing even more for informal carers during the COVID pandemic. So it was a, a critical uh, importance to us when we were looking at this. But um, on the 23rd of March, we did consolidate. We have two respite services, Eden Lodge and Wicket Hearn Road. But we agreed that um, we would um, consolidate and use um, Eden Lodge as our, our base for respite during the lockdown period. And um, that, that would focus primarily on um, emergency respite, um, short stay placements. Um, Primarily, our respite is used for um, rolling respite, so people will use it every eight weeks for breaks. Some of that will be weekends. Then again, some people will use it for uh, to allow them to have a longer holiday away, um, two weeks, one week period. So it's used as a regular rolling um, programme for many people, as well as always offering emergency. But we had nine beds at um, Eden Lodge, which were utilised. And throughout the pandemic, there was weekly uh, meetings with them, um, again, with the provider and the adult learning disability team. And we were able, everybody who were identified as needing emergency respite at that time were accommodated. We did in June um, open some beds at Wicket Hearn because we needed some extra capacity. So in June, we had, I think, six people accessing Wicket Earn Road. Um, so we did start to um, to open up um, and, and expand as, as we needed to. We did have some impact on staffing um, in terms of them having to isolate, although throughout the pandemic and even to date, we haven't had any cases of confirmed COVID in our services and we haven't had any staff members that have been positive of COVID in respite either. So that's that has been a, a really, really positive thing. We've continued to um, provide access. So um, individuals, families, carers have got access to staff at respite services. So we've always had an open phone line to them. We've, you know, they've been in touch with us and likewise, we've made proactive calls to them. Um, the um, so as I say, everybody has had um, ongoing dialogue. Um, in September, at the beginning of September, we recognised that as the length of the obviously pandemic is continued, not the pandemic, but we're still obviously experiencing COVID in our communities, that we needed to look at um, supporting carers to have longer breaks and to start to open up some of our our sort of general. Um, sort of respite beds capacity. So we reopened Wicket and Lodge fully at the beginning of September and we have started to take bookings for um, ongoing respite. Uh, that was communicated and, and that's, um, that's going really, really well. Um, for September in 2019, we um, we had 38 people supported in our respite. And then for um, this September, um, we've supported 31 people. So there's a marginal difference for September. We're, we're almost back up to how we were in 2019. But over the lockdown period, we supported uh, 42 uh, people in emergency placements. But as, as I was describing, um, we are now open for general um, people to access general respite facilities. So that's going well. One of the fundamental things I think is important to mention is testing. So um, there was government guidance came out in um, in July about testing um, uh, for residents and staff. But then that was sort of um, put back till September, um, particularly as a, as a policy. Uh, for respite and, and any bed-based services. And 
since July, um, we were testing residents coming into services and before that actually I think we were more proactive in Doncaster particularly around hospital discharge so anybody coming out of hospital were tested but what we've done um, as well uh, as an additional uh, and in line with the guidance is we've introduced uh, testing for anyone coming into our services from home into our respite they are tested before they come and also our staff are tested every week. So we've got a system now where the services are testing all their staff. And this includes not just respite, but all our residential services and our um, sort of positive step assessment unit as well. So that's now fully embedded and, and working really, really well. Also throughout the um, lockdown and, and, and beyond, we have not struggled uh, as services to access PPE. We've always had access to um, adequate PPE, uh, even though I know nationally at the onset that was an issue for some people and I know uh, a challenge for us, but at, at no time was that ever uh, where we didn't have adequate adequate supplies of that. Just, I'll, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but I think just importantly want to mention the um, outbreak management plans that sit around our services. So we are, um, as part of respite service, we do have an outbreak management plan and that feeds into um, the corporate um, outbreak management uh, system. So the daily incident management meetings that happen corporately, we do feed in, would feed into those should we ever have any outbreaks or, or positive cases. And likewise, that also feeds up to the COVID control board. So at this moment in time, fingers crossed long may it continue. We haven't we haven't seen any any incidents of COVID um, so far. Thank you. I don't know whether Phil you want to say anything else. I don't think so, Chair. I, I, I can come in on questions and, 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 and anything else, but I think Debbie summarised the position really well. Thank you. Yes. Well, we have lots of questions, so that, that would be good. I'm sure there will be opportunity when we'll be pleased to hear your responses to those uh, some of those these questions. So um, we'll go to um, Pat, who has the first two questions. Pat, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can we be confident that all our clients have been contacted and therefore supported uh, from experience of a constituent who has social care needs, although not learning or autism uh, disability um, she had great difficulty in contacting the social care team staff were working from home and the phone lines were not diverting in the first few months so just wondered whether we've gone you know got in touch with everybody that we needed to Debbie please go ahead um, I understand um, that there was a problem in the north area with the IT system in the early days when when staff in the lock, initial sets of the lockdown when staff were working from home, as you say, um, that wasn't identified for, for quite a while. Um, the individual, I am aware of the individual and um, the, um, the phones were diverted to the ISAT team, but for that individual, she didn't they didn't get a call back. Um, the member of staff who were there, key worker, was was absent due to a bereavement. So we are we are responding to a complaint um, for that individual at the moment, but do recognise that there was an issue with the system to begin with. Um, we have, as part of the business continuity, identified that and put in robust measures to ensure that the rigorous testing of the phone lines at any diversion point are, are thoroughly tested because that that did that was a, a, an issue in the north area unfortunately um, in the main staff um, in the adult team the general locality teams have contacted individuals all individuals who were known to them um, and again like learning disability teams everybody was uh, risk assessed in terms of the level of support they would need during the lockdown period but um, I do know that that individual situation um, there was a problem just obviously concerned if anybody else got missed that's all so um, can you be confident that you've contacted everybody with learning disability and autism 
I am I am confident that we have got everybody um but we've picked everybody up in in that call definitely thank Phil, you would you like to come in yeah, I, mean, I, I, I can I, I can confirm um, my reception is not great. So if I sound like a Dalek, do do tell me. Um, but um, I can confirm, Councillor Haith, that we we as as Debbie said, we, we kind of risk assessed um, everybody and then contacted them appropriately. Um, that we have had feedback from from other councillors over time of people that they worried about that, that have fallen through the net or what maybe we've made contact with the person directly and family members have wanted to get involved and, and talk to us. So we, we still, obviously, it's always really helpful. It's, it's always really helpful to hear where we have people that feel like they need some further contact with us. So, um, you know, I think we feel that our approach is reasonably sound, but it's always good to, to get um, feedback from councillors to say, can you just check with that individual? Because I'm not sure that a few, a few there, there's a few loose ends to be tied up. OK, thank you. Um, Chair, with your permission, my next question was on virtual day activities. I mean, obviously, these must be reliant on the correct hardware and software and a good broadband speed. Have clients been given support for this where needed? Am I OK to answer that? Um, in terms of um, support, we haven't provided any actual kit or um, digital equipment to any individuals what we have done is we've provided support for people who have wanted advice and and direction on how to use the equipment so people have as we've been contacting them some people have bought new laptops or they've bought new um, pieces of kit and they've asked our staff if that we can talk them through how to use it so we we have um we have offered that um, nobody's actually come to us and said they've got a problem with the broadband or they want access to any sort of IT equipment and they haven't got it. I think if that would have come through, we would have tried to look for solutions because I know um, there's been money through COVID um, come through for different, you know, a, a number of things from a locality point of view as well. Um, but that's not been an issue that's that's been raised um, to date. Um, so we have been on hand to to help and learn people to use things, but other than that, um, no. Okay, thank you. I mean, obviously, I'm a school governor, and um, schools were given the opportunity to ask for, you know, additional uh, IT equipment, uh, and they were given support. So, just wonder if the same had happened for our clients or so. No. Phil, would you like to come in? Yeah, so I mean, just just to add to Debbie's answer, just just to be one hundred percent clear, which and Debbie, I think Debbie was clear on this. We're, we're we're not hiding behind technology and saying, well, it's 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 that person's problem if they can't access the technology because that's our offer. So as Debbie said, we we would follow up very proactively. Um, there hasn't been a an offer of proactive offer of IT kind of preemptively that's come from the council. What we can do though, and what we will do is, is think about how we approach technology going forward. So especially where, um, obviously as we know, especially younger generations coming through, um, relying on technology for more of their interactions and that being a bigger part of their lives than it might have been for us growing up. So thinking about how we make sure people have access to technology will be part of what we do. And also avoiding situations where actually we've got old fashioned services going across people's doorsteps or or taking them to things when actually access to technology for them is something that will unlock a lot more. So, yeah, it's, it's the, I think it's the right challenge. We can provide assurance going for going from now, though, that we're not letting bad technology get in the way of, 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 of our offer. And we will follow up proactively with anyone who says, they don't have the technology to um, to engage with with what we're trying what we've put in place during the COVID period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is Councillor Laney May Balls. You did touch on this, Debbie, in uh, when you were talking to us initially, um, but we are interested in in hearing more around buildings. Laney May, would you like to introduce the question? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. So just in total, how long? Um, have these buildings been closed and have you completed some impact assessments on people that would normally use them 
And as you've mentioned before, that um, four are still closed. So you look, when we're looking to get these back open, as you mentioned, that there's going to have to be modifications that are done. So what's the time scale for that? Um, thank you. The buildings um, were closed from the 23rd of uh, March until early in July. So 16 weeks they were closed. So we started to reopen um, sort of late July. Um, again, um, in terms of... Um, the impact assessment. Yes, we again that's been sort of covered in their um, risk assessments for individuals, um, and the table in the report um, highlights the different buildings that that we have. So, as I said, in uh, some are our buildings, some some are uh, owned by a third party. Um, so we, because of the measures and the restrictions, we've had to mark the buildings out. We've had to ensure that there's adequate space uh, for people to social distance when they come in the bubbles uh, again we've got to facilitate around the staff the exiting and 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 the um bathroom facilities so it has been a huge huge piece of work that's had to be um done really and some of the buildings lend themselves better to that than others so for example sterling center is a large building that's got multiple rooms it lends itself to that we've been able to make use of the space and then you've got you know other buildings um such as the uh, bartia um and um stainforth um that you know are smaller so you know for, for staying for we've only be able to create bubbles of four and there isn't the breakout areas to use so again um we've had to be very clear about what you know and say thinking around the safety of individuals and and um, we have um, as i say we've had the fire officer and our um, health and safety officers out multiple times and we're having we we keep getting sent back to do more because we're just not things are just not as they need to be in some of these buildings so it's not been easy um it has been a challenge i think it's been a bigger challenge than i thought it would be um so again um we also because in between the sessions there is also um a huge ask around cleaning and sanitation. So we've had to build that into um, the day and that's why some of the centres have got a day where they haven't been open because they've had to do deep cleans in between. But as we're going along, we're learning more about how we can build that into our more daily process. So we are now starting to be able to expand and open more days because as I say, we're learning as we go along. Um, there are still um, challenges um, and we're still not open at Bentley Library. Um, we've just been out again with our health and safety team and our fire officer and that is proving to be um, one of the venues which is looking unlikely that we're, our, we're going to be able to go back there. We're looking to open Bartia Centre next week, so that's looking really positive. And Redmond Centre has been signed off yesterday, so we will be opening the Redmond Centre. Mex Campus, um, we still don't have a date for reopening Mex Campus. Um, we've got uh, further work to do, and we're in touch with the trustees um, there, and we're, we're working through the risk assessment, and that the, we do need some modification work done there. Um, and then the Ace Garden service, um, we're going to be opening that again in two weeks um, and we're going to be starting to pick up some of our old contract work there. So again, it is a bit of a mixed, a mixed sort of view really and it's all dependent on the buildings. What, what we have to what we identified very early on in, in the risk assessment is there are some individuals who we support who would not be able to adhere to the social distancing measures of their cognition, their behaviours. So we have to consider a range of not just the building, but also the individuals and how safely can we bring those individuals back into a building. So for some people, we are providing support in their home. So we're doing home visits where we can do activities with one on a one-to-one -one or um, um, rather than bringing them into, into a building. So we've had to think of a, a range of different ways and the building is just one, one of those. So I'm, I'm optimistic that um, we should have more of the centres open um, in two weeks, but um, I can't 
uh, um, I am concerned that we've still got a solution to find at Mexborough and Bentley will be ongoing, I would say. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. That was, yeah, thank you, Debbie. Uh, Phil, would you like to come in with your questions? Yeah, hi, Debbie. Um, um, it, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry, was that? That was me, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Apologies. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be speaking. I'm shutting up now, Councillor Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um. Hi. Um. Paragraph hi, yeah. five two says that the day services and respite provide vital support. So pre-lockdown, how many people would access those services in any given month? Um. In any given month. Um. Is I that know... the thirty-eight figure that you referred to from September last year? Sorry, whereas in terms of the 38 figure, they, it, that was the respite service. So um, in terms of respite, on a given month, yes, um, we would support, um, well, it depends on what month, August, in, if we're talking about the respite services, in August, because that's the month when lots of people go on holiday, um, when we're gen working in normal times, we would see up to 81 people accessing respite in the height of the summer. That's our busiest month, if, if you like. But people weren't going on holiday um, this year as, as they would have done. So for this year in August, we supported 24 people. So that that was that sort of the, the comparator in the summer. In mm. the spring, we would generally support an average of 49 people um, and we were supporting sort of 21 in the emergency um, period and then in September uh, we would generally support well last year we supported 38 people and this year we've supported 31. So um, in terms of the seasons because it does affect who uses the service on a regular basis um, the biggest shift was the August period because um, that is when we would generally support people to go away on holiday, which didn't happen this year. And in terms of the day services, do a majority of your 384 clients access the day service sessions yeah. um, on a regular basis or occasional yes. basis? Um, most to 10 regular and um, that varies between some people with learning disabilities access five days a week um, older people uh, and some people um, attend one or two days so it's a mix mix of um, days dependent on individuals needs so um, yeah it, it varies from five to one day can be a mix yeah thank you very much I'd like to bring in Lainey Mabel. You have a, another question? <coughs> yes, thank you. Uh, just going back to the risk rating assessments that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, obviously, you, you took everything into account. So it's just clarifying was it around the risk or vulnerability in relation to, to having COVID? Um, and what came out of uh, risk assessing them in terms of being at home or you know at risk of abuse or issues that arise from being in a confined place so what action plans came out of that piece of work between the community adult learning disability team and, and us as the provider we assessed all the different factors from being the risk of covid their health condition their current needs their, their sort of assets and the networks that they've got around them um, and also um, the impact of remaining at home and the tensions, mental health um, aspects of that. Um, uh, all of those factors were considered and the lead person um, doing that work um, for those who were in the higher risk was our community adult learning disability team who, because some of these individuals have health health support as well and mental health support so 
we're just one of the uh, providers. Uh, so those in the red areas and bracket of the eligible, sort of the risk rating, they had very, very robust plans. Everybody had a support plan, but depending on the severity. And interestingly, what we saw is the people, some of the people who we who um, throughout the pandemic did better than probably some of the ones that we thought would struggle more did better because they had they had a strong asset base around them and family and networks and some who um, who we didn't. So that monitoring and ongoing oversight of those individuals was were really important and allowed us to flex around who needed to come into respite, what other, other support, whether it was just additional, you know, giving people access to somebody at the end of a phone when they needed it. So it was a combination of all, all of that. Um, and I think it was in July, we did start to see the impact of COVID start to, to sort of bear uh, more around people um, in not, as you say, being able to get out, not having the um, net sort of connectivity with people. And that's when, as I say, we, we did start to shift and open again some of these um, other services. But it has been a wider health and social care sort of um, collaborative around these individuals. Thank you for that. I can see that Phil Holmes would like to come in, Phil. Yeah, yeah Councillor Gibbons has got his hand up, but I was just, I was just <coughs> addressing, I just addressed the, 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 this point this point at hand just to um, build on what um, Debbie said. Just to make it really clear, it's helpful that the Community Adult Learning Disability team hold the ring on the risk assessment because um, the provider service themselves have a lot of integrity and a lot of focus on the needs of people. But it's helpful that the community adult learning disability team have an arm's length relationship with, with the provider, are able to think about their stat our statutory responsibilities, which actually Debbie outlined at the start of her presentation to those people, and make sure that we're, we're fulfilling those um, using the services that we run, using supported living services that we commission and so on. So that it feels good. And unfortunately, Annika, the head of service there has not been able to come today because she's had a, an, an urgent kind of casework issue that she's had to deal with. But um, that kind of arm's length approach means that we're not we're not running services that are kind of judge and jury around what what the outcomes for, for the people using them are. We're using the social work teams to provide that kind of professional distance around that assessment. Thank you. Uh, for the purpose of the recording, I'll explain that Councillor Sean Gibbons joined just after we'd done the introductions. Uh, Councillor Gibbons, you're very welcome. And if I can bring you in now, I can see your hands raised. Please, uh, please go ahead. You're on mute. Is that better? Good morning, everyone. Apologies. Um, morning. What's going on at the moment? So I just wanted to join better late than never, as always. Just to pick up on the point, Debbie, with regards to Mexpra um, and the Youth Community Centre, I am a trustee of Mexpra Miners Welfare. There is a meeting this evening, actually, of trustees. So if you want to just uh, drop me an email with any concerns, I know a couple of trustees have been working hard to try and get the building reopened for Smile, um, and yeah. work is ongoing. Just let me know what's needed, and I will raise it this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. No problem. Uh, Councillor Phil Cole, I think you have just some uh, additional questions. Yes. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Paragraph 6.3 refers to um, gardening, Tai Chi, virtual gardening, Zoom sessions. Um, what proportion of your clients um, took part in the Zoom sessions? It was a smaller proportion, about 30 people. So there was a group of 12 at Rosington and, and a group of 18 in the East area that was sort of facilitated through the um, staying for smile so um yeah we we there were sessions that we used to do on site so we've got an um, expert tai chi trainer in our services who, who led on who led on that um the gardening ones it was initiatives that people did themselves really that they they did sort of gardening at home and then we we did a lot through the newsletters so people would send their stories in around what they'd done and what they'd learned so 
yeah it was I think it was at the time when when in lockdown when families were getting together and going walking and doing some of the things that had not sort of had time to do in the past so there was lots of like little um sort of things happening uh, and as I say we did drop off some activity packs um some quizzes and some um other so we could sort of connect people then on the whatsapp with the quizzing and things but the zoom sessions were about 30 people that that suggests that if the zoom sessions are only reaching what eight percent of your clients then in a way it was no substitute for the closures that happened um and as for in terms of families going walking and stuff like that, you would imagine that they would do that in an ordinary week anyway, long before COVID-19, that they would do that of their own accord. So it seems to me that that one thing we, one conclusion we should draw was that the closure of the centres led to a, a massive drop off in engagement with these people. Um. Agreeing that yes, there was a small proportion. Um, that that was obviously a choice by choice. Um, I think we connected with everybody in some way or other, whether that just be via the phone. It was never going to be of, on the on the scale of what we did when we had our buildings open. So, um, given like we said earlier around the risk to these individuals, it was um, you know a necessity really and. Um, you know, it would have been great if we could have carried on opening the buildings, but it, it just wasn't safe to continue that. I think with the families, what they told us, because we, one of the things that we've gathered um, is a lot of insight from families. And whilst um, I, I sort of accept your point around families would have done all these things with their um, loved ones anyway, a lot of people didn't. Because um, a lot of the carers who support some of our individuals work and they don't have that time. So because people weren't in work and uh, they were doing things, dif you know, different things like a lot a lot of families did who, who weren't able to go to work. So it was a joint collaborative effort around, um, you know, what what can we do? What, what do people want to do? Because, again, um, a lot of this is driven by what the individual wants um, and not us saying you must engage in a Zoom session or you must engage in in this activity. Again, um, it was down to what people people wanted but what we wanted to be clear about is that we were there to support people albeit not in the same way um but um we would try and do workarounds and i think we did i feel that the staff were creative and did the best that they could uh yeah not nothing on the scale of what what happens in a normal time unfortunately um thanks very much i mean that brings me to a related question which is obviously if the the virtual activity can't substitute for the 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 brilliant activity that that happens in the um, day centers um what under the new operating model what's what proportion of the usual um capacity does the do the new arrangements allow for um is it 30% 40% 50% attendance uh, compared to normal or no, it's it's lower than that at the moment. It's around uh, around ten percent in terms of people going into the buildings. It's it's very low um, so at the minute. So you're saying that even somewhere like um, I I visited the Rosington one at the Memorial um, Hall. Um, uh, are you saying that that where I would have normally seen twenty, thirty, forty people in the building, I'll only see three or four? Yeah, you will. Yeah, you will only see a bubble of six um, so at any one time in in there. The the thing is as well is I I don't have the figures at hand, but I've asked for them. Is that um, a lot of people are still not wanting to come back? So um, we have um, had discussions, as I say, with everybody, and we have we have got I understand in the service. There are still lots of people who are saying until there's a vaccine, we won't be we won't be sending our loved one back into a building based service because they just feel the risk is too great. Um, so, again, um, 
people are choosing to say no that even you know if we we could offer um again there'll be there'll be a set and i can i can separately send the percentage at the minute of those um people who are still not ready to come back so but if you're only um uh having 10 percent of people in the building um i i would have thought that i get the health concern doesn't that mean that you're having to run many more sessions to offer something to everybody? We're, we're offering different sessions. So we're offering home visits. We're offering, um, again, we're still doing some of the virtual. We're still doing the phone calls. So we're still doing a combination of different things. So the, um, the building based offer is, is just one of those um, one of those options. So we've got staff dispersed doing doing all sorts of different activities at the moment. And they're taking people out on a one-to-one -one basis for walks, doing activities and hobbies that they they like. So we, we're just creating a, a dash a bit of a dashboard that shows us what people are accessing, what what they are, those that don't want to access a building, but what they want to do. We've just uh, I, I, I meant to mention actually, we've just um, sent out a quality assurance um survey out to all the uh, people who use services just to say um to capture some insight into their experience what they would like to see within the parameters of the current situation that we find ourselves in so um again we can share that once we get that feedback in from people thank, thank you. you i can see that Phil Holmes has his hand raised and also Councillor Sean Gibbons wants to come in. So I'll just pause you there, uh, Councillor Cole, if that's all right, and sure. just bring Phil in and then Sean. Yeah, it's just to, um, I suppose it's just to make the point, I guess, that I mean, kind of, kind of massive drop off is was kind of the phrase used. And there's definitely a significant change as, 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 um, as you um, teased out, Councillor Cole and Debbie provided around people using traditional um, bricks and mortar day services. Um, the, the massive asset within the small service is the people that work within it. Um, so I think what, what Debbie has referred to is, is th those people continuing to work flat out and probably working harder than they've ever had to actually um, in terms of running a range of flexible um, things that suit people in, in the circumstances that they're in. So it's a bit of a jobs worth thing to talk about our statutory responsibilities, but our statutory responsibilities are about meaningfully meeting the needs of people um, with, with COVID as a new issue that we're having to take on board in terms of our risk assessment. And we're doing that. Um, and, and also we're, we're also working with other providers to do that. So supported living was mentioned and having, you know, that opportunity has been to give supported living providers some responsibility to think about the day opportunities they're providing safely as well, rather than transporting people to, to settings where at this point in time they're less safe. So it feels to me that we, again, I don't want this to come across as spin or euphemism. Um, people have experienced a massive change in their lives. Um, we haven't reduced the service that we're providing in terms of how hard our people are working, and we've had to use other forms of support and service as well alongside as Debbie says the decisions that people are making as individuals and families in their own right about the balance that they want in their lives at this time and the risks that they're prepared to take so I think that's probably the, the impression that, that Debbie's trying to get across it's not it's not straightforward as, as it used to be in terms of going into a building and seeing who's there it's unfortunately become more complicated but I think that the staff in the service are managing it really well from my perspective. Thank you. Councillor Gibbons, you're on mute. Yes, take two. <laughs> just catching up on the um, on the questions and in terms of what was just being discussed, I just wanted to make a point that in Mexborough, the SMILE team headed up by Julie Holman um, and, and a, a team are really working hard. I'm aware of that, um, but it's just looking now obviously we want to get this building um you know sort of recommissioned again but still with the limitations of the the bubbles of six um and looking at other places in mexico where i know that the smile clients love to go 
uh, weather spoons. They're restricted in there. They can only go in sixes. You know, you can't book a table. Uh, the bingo hall, I found out this morning, the bingo hall, Empire Bingo, is not reopening. Um, so that's another thing that's uh, obviously another place where uh, it's the activities that the Smile um, service users would enjoy. Uh, Avalunch, uh, who worked for 20 years providing hot meals at the Baptist Church, uh, actually have decided um, with lockdown just to not reopen. That's they've done. Uh, because of an older volunteer population. So it's really difficult when you look at where we are at the moment, even when we're trying to provide some statutory provision and even in the community, we're getting less and less places for them to visit. Um, and all I'm thinking now is that we can try and maybe um, a call to action for the third sector, the volunteers to try and step up uh, and provide more support through Be Friend, uh, Churches Together, where there's more volunteers um, who have time and are willing to make contact uh, with the, the Smile service users. So I'm, I'm happy to to be part of that if we can try and look at sort of some alternative approach because every day more and more provision um, is either closing or deciding not to reopen. So what is it going to be left? Does Debbie or Phil want to comment further on that point? Yeah, I, I, um, I, just, I, think, I just think we've gone. Yeah. Oh, sorry, on, Phil. I, I we were just talking yesterday around, you know, the good neighbours sort of principle um, around, you know, the when you think about when we went in the COVID uh, pandemic started. The, the community response to that was phenomenal in terms of looking after your neighbours. And again, I know we've got the voluntary sector and community sector, but again, I just think there's an opportunity for how we really push around that neighbourliness, that support and, you know, that sort of going back to the old traditional um, neighbourhood support uh, schemes that we had. But again, you know, it, it does work. It does work. And uh, so I think it's something I totally agree, Sean, with with what you're saying. I I agree, too. And I think, you know, it, it's good to have, um, you know, members who are kind of community activists who, who want to help us make connections with with, you know, in all different parts of the borough. We would we, we, we want to work with that. I think the important assurance to provide, though, is that um, communities and voluntary sector organisations sometimes feel leaned on quite a lot. So just the assurance to provide is that in, in doing that, in working in the way that Councillor Gibbons is describing, what we won't be doing is abrogating our own responsibilities as, as, a, as a provider. So so it's, it's just about in the spirit of that offer is as adding further opportunities or, or further options for people. And it's a really helpful um, offer to be given. Thank you. If I can, oh, if if you I like can to just, come back, yes, yes, by all means. Just to say that that that's that is really encouraging. I, I agree that you know, we, we can't be, um, you know, putting more and more pressure on the third sector uh, in the absence of of statutory provision. But I do think we need to start to build up a plan because, um, especially on the meal provision, we are now looking at potentially um, you know, sort of filling that gap and even if we can get to a point where the churches, I know a couple of the um, the church leaders, Adam Lynch in Love Mexper, he, he was chomping at the bit to provide uh, hot meals um, to school children at the start of the pandemic. If, um, if provision wasn't there, they were going to step up and provide free school meals um, also at home. So um, I think we really need to try and sort of look at where the, the needs are and if we can sort of work with the third sector in partnership uh, we have got uh, you know a, a good uh, sort of you know, willing workforce we have some buildings we, we have we have food we have some food resources so if we can try and sort of even even having a, a call on uh, service users uh, two or three times a week with um, a hot meal a sandwich some snacks or something like that then at least you can then use that as an opportunity to uh, to check in on them as well <coughs> Would you like to respond? I can see your hands up. Yeah, it's just, it's just I suppose it's just to say that um, there's a lot of overlap here, isn't there? Um, the stage we're up to around COVID and you know what we're reading in the papers and seeing in the news and how what we're also specifically seeing in 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 um in some of our communities and we know Mexico in particular have been badly affected by COVID recently, for example. And um, now's the time where we're starting to think how do we stand up 
community arrangements for the next phase. So it's, it overlaps with this, but it's not quite the same as this. Um, but I suppose it's just worth saying that um, I guess scrutiny will want to be assured about the next stage for Doncaster, about how we stand up the sort of support that Councillor Gibbons is describing, where there is an overlap with, as I say, with day support, but it's not quite the same. And there's a much broader application for, for Doncaster to communities so it's just to, it's just to make that point and I guess it might be something separate that scrutiny want assurance on um, probably cross-cutting over um, in relatively soon in terms of how we're, how we're approaching that mm. Mm. thank you yes I I do think that we would like to uh, to take you up on that uh, Phil and I also thought uh, Debbie when you referred to uh, the survey that you're doing um, it would be really good for us to um, to see when you have collated that and report you're reporting on it um you know we we really do want to hear the voice of service users and and through that survey we would be able to so um please can i confirm that we members of the panel would like uh, would, would like that to be circulated to them uh, when when you have it that would be good um you. martin you councillor martin greenhalgh had one last question but in my opinion debbie has already more than answered your question um, but i don't want to cut you out so um can i just bring you in to confirm that you are happy that we that we don't pursue your question uh yes uh, good morning um yes i'm quite content with debbie's uh, explanation uh, my yes. specific uh, point was actually and i think mr um, well phil uh, um the case uh, that uh, I'm not actually going to refer to is it's an individual in my uh, constituency which is, is been going down now for 10 years. Uh, I just wondered were there any specific areas um, within the within our DMBC organisation that can look at individual cases and, and to give an independent assessment because it really is a troublesome thing to the whole area. That aside, the other point I wanted to make is what we were talking about just prior to my coming in. Um, uh, and it was um, Mr Gibbons was, um, uh, uh, bringing the attention of a lack of lacking resources now. People are dropping out because of the sixth rule and one thing or another. Certainly in my ward, there are three very, very strong individual self-help groups set up one is actually a registered charity on on the basis of a uh a, 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 a village uh, self-help group um uh, i feel that we might not be doing them justice if we don't actually get in touch with these individuals it might be uh, an idea if, if, if um, debbie or phil um, um could have a, perhaps a list of contact details and just see what these people could actually offer within their local communities we don't seem to be communicating with this new group of, of people which came about with the with the start of this uh, this uh, this uh, ongoing concern. So I, I would welcome I would welcome any um, suggestions on that and perhaps even including uh, uh, staff as it seems. Oh, well, not so that but I've all supported it. The network of parish councils to to, to put a, 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 a not a plea, a request of additional support, which might might be useful in the in, in the coming months and years until we get this vaccine sorted. I suppose. I think that's about me done. Thank you, Martin. Phil, you've helpfully put your hand up. Yes, we're delighted to bring you in with the, with with a response to Martin's concerns. So, so just just I think the two points that um, that you made, Councillor. Um, First point is um, we have single points of contact for particular individuals in the borough who um, who regularly express concerns that are, are diplomatically say a little bit circular in nature and 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 um, uh, obviously sometimes dragging quite a few people into into going over those concerns again. Um, the, the individual you refer to, I think, is is in that category. Um, we're always trying to focus on those individuals and think about how we can improve the, the support we give them and the support we give other organizations it's probably no quick fix though unfortunately um in in that in those situations but um you know we'll, we'll, we'll keep we we'll keep things under review i think in terms of the second point you made about local community organizations it links in with councillor given's point i think 
So the, the next stage of work for the, for the council needs to be um, how do we work with communities, with organisations in communities, individuals in communities to, dis to make the most of what they're offering and also provide support to them. So that's outside the scope of this direct piece of work we're talking about with you about now, but it is it is the piece of work around what we'd call locality working, how, how are we connecting? And we're, we're building that up on a locality by locality basis. So just as we should be picking up with, with Mexborough colleagues, the strengths in that area, we should also be picking up with Tickle colleagues and, and everyone else in, in the borough. So we, we, we can, we will certainly be mopping that up over the next month or two. Debbie. Yeah, just to add to what Phil said, in terms of the locality work, um, we've been starting to pull together the local community asset maps, which includes all the um, community local voluntary sector groups that are active in those areas. So we have got a really strong profile um, of in, for each locality, actually, that's getting built. So that will help us in terms of our engagement um, with those um, key groups is, is what um, what councillor um, Greenhall has just said. So that's just a bit more of an assurance on that we're all we are mapping that. Thank you. Um, well, this morning we were invited to uh, consider the information in your report and, and I feel we've done that very successfully. Thank you very much to Debbie and Phil. Thank you, Debbie, for the report. Thank you for coming this morning um, answering the questions with customary openness, honesty. Um, it's been it's been good to hear and please convey to all of those staff in those day services that are doing what Phil described in terms of having to work differently, uh, think more creatively uh, than they ever have before um, in order to keep those services going um, to respond to the individual needs of, um, of of our citizens. So please convey to them our, our appreciation for all the good work that you've been able to describe to us this morning. It's really encouraging. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Debbie and Phil are free to leave us. Colleagues, we will now take um, um, a, a 10 minute uh, break and then we will resume uh, with um, the next, um, the second item on our agenda. So if we can all be back by 11.17, we will actually resume at 11.17, but we will just take this opportunity for, for a break. Thank you. And on that basis, I'm going to officially reopen this meeting okay. uh, and welcome uh, <coughs> Victor Joseph and Shannon Kennedy, who are both joining us uh, to uh, talk about, I'm going to give it its, uh, its proper official title, the um, health, sorry, when I get to the right page. The Health Protection Assurance Report. Um, and uh, Victor, you've just got um, a couple of minutes, just two or three minutes maximum, just to kind of give us a flavour because we, we we have all read it. And um, and Shannon also, in order to introduce herself, just a, just a couple of minutes and then we'll get straight into our questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody uh, for, the, for this opportunity. Uh, we should have had this report uh, in March, but because of the uh, situation related to COVID, uh, it was postponed, uh, but it's really grateful to um, to be back here with, with Shannon. I'll give opportunity to her. Uh, you will see that the report covers um, three key areas around immunization and screening, uh, air quality, emergency planning, and, and, and flooding, and including the, the work on, on COVID. Uh, looking back last year, um, there are some kind of progress uh, in terms of the areas um, uh, we, we, we we went out and look at. Um, obviously, there are also challenges as well, which we'll, we'll pick up as part of the discussion going on. Uh, so, so there has been a lot of work uh, with GP practices, particularly looking at um, those practices which had got um, lower uptake of uh, flu vaccination to try to see address some of those challenges. We did work with uh, care homes. Uh, to try to uh, increase uh, flu vaccination rate in in those practice, particularly for uh, for staff, and and some of them uh, two at least were able to kind of get uh, the award for, from NHS England, and and we do have and we continue to have the smart agency flu plan, which we update year on year, 
um, which bring all, all, all the agencies together. Uh, and also on uh, air quality, um, there has been a lot of uh, work uh, to, to build to build on that, uh, including uh, as a part of the work on the Doncaster Active uh, um, Travel Alliance. So uh, we have a picture of some progress, but there remain some challenges, particularly now we've got also, also COVID. Uh, some of the responsibility, particularly around immunization and screening sits with NHS England, but we work closely with them to, to ensure to provide assurance that we have systems in place working together to address some of those challenges together. So um, with, with that brief um, introduction, um, I'll pass over to my colleague to just say hello uh, and, um, and a few words before we go into the questions that you've got. Uh, yes, good morning. Can you hear me? First of all, I'm using the headset. Excellent. Um, yes, hello. Uh, thank you for um, allowing me to join you today to all the members. I'm Shannon Kennedy and I am a public health specialty registrar, so I'm training to become a consultant in public health. Um, I'm on my first placement here in, in Doncaster Council and I joined at the beginning of August. So um, when you're asking questions later on, anything that predates that probably have to refer to, to Victor, but uh, unsurprisingly based on my start date, I've been very much involved in the COVID response which has been the majority of what we've all been doing. Um, and I, I suppose I would add as a precy to the uh, discussion of the, the contents of the report and the update that I suspect many of you will have a, questions about the COVID response. And since there's been a change to the membership, I understand uh, some, uh, some of the membership of this panel, uh, just to remind that the, the report refers to the prior financial year so the upcoming report will have more substance around uh, the impact of covid but we'll try to uh, respond to any pressing questions today thank you yeah thank you uh, so for for new members uh, who are meeting first time um, I'm, I'm victor just also a consultant in public health and i chair the health protection assurance group for, for Doncaster. so that brings together all the uh, relevant agencies uh, together, uh, for example, NHS England, CCG colleagues, our acute hospital and the primary care uh, uh, colleagues as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really um, brilliant introduction, just exactly what I asked for. Thank you very much indeed to both of you for that. Um, Victor, if I could just ask you to just switch off your microphone when you're not speaking, because from some somewhere we get it. Thank you. Yeah, it is yours. We're, we're getting um, a, a background noise, a, a humming noise. So that's um, that, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so we have a quite a list of questions for you both. And the first one is from Councillor Martin Greenhouse. Would you like to come in, Martin, with your question? You need to unmute yourself. and switch on your video. I want yes. Yes, yes. Go I'm ahead sorry. with your I'm question, so Martin. I had the parish right. councillor on the other phone. I had to take his call, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we we're at the appropriate point for your question, Martin, about immunisation and vulnerable people. Yes, I, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, I, uh, I just wonder what, uh, a process uh, of encouragement or guidance uh, is in place uh, to take up uh, uh, the flu vaccinations by uh, uh, vulnerable people, especially people with, say, uh, uh, anxiety problems or, or mental health issues. I, I just wondered if there was anything specifically in place to be able to to encourage them to uh, to, uh, to to take the vaccine. Thank you. Victor, unfortunately, you're still muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we are concerned about uh, the impact of, uh, of flu vaccination, particularly for um, um, vulnerable uh, disadvantaged uh, groups. Uh, and, and that includes, uh, rightly, uh, people with mental health problem anxi anxiety. Um, we work with GPs. They've got a list of high risk um, uh, groups that they prioritize, uh, but also we work closely 
uh, with um, uh, our providers uh, to, to try to ensure that uh, uh, particular others, uh, those, those patients who are part of uh, their, their, their system uh, under their care, they are encouraged to, um, to, to, to access uh, flu vaccination. But we also do have uh, a, a small group of people uh, who, for some reason, may be in hospital. Uh, we, we are working to see how uh, those who haven't got vaccination through the GPs might be picked up through uh, those, those systems. But primarily, uh, vaccination uh, are done through the GP, uh, GP practices. So uh, the key thing really is to ensure that uh, GP practices are supported, to ensure that uh, people on their, on their list who are eligible for, for uh, flu vaccination get it. Uh, there are also challenges uh, that we have been picking up um, year on year. Those challenges seem to have not uh, go away because they are, they are beyond the control of the GP practice themselves. For example, things like flu availability of the vaccine itself. But there has been quite innovative um, uh, approach that uh, our CCG and primary care have put together. Uh, for example, um, uh, targeting people who are homeless, um, how, how we can be able to offer them flu vaccination uh, and when one of the practices has really been uh, on board in terms of health support, particularly in, in the town center area. And, and that has been um, uh, a welcome uh, initiative. We do have health inequality working group, which we set up, which brings together the CCG, the primary care colleagues. And we've kind of been discussing some of these kind of um, uh, initiative, a bit of the gray area where potentially the out group of people that probably might be left out. How we ensure that we have a system to be able to um, to uh, support and offer flu vaccination to, to those group. So we still do have that uh, ongoing meeting with the CCG colleagues um, to ensure that um, uh, the, the, the systems that is set up through the, the primary care system uh, works, particularly for GP because uh, all those who are considered at risk and, and, and most likely uh, uh, the group you're talking about would fall into those in, into those categories. But also there's quite extended list um, as part of this year so that um, in, in the past it's people who are 65 years and over, but it's been lowered now so that uh, people who are, are 50 years plus can be able to get uh, uh, free uh, flu vaccination. We are conscious uh, of the challenges as uh, we are starting because um, we're being made aware about um, the availability issues. But we just hope that um, that that would uh, not that would get sorted out fairly quickly through through the national system. Uh, it's not a local issue. The the issue of about availability, uh, but it is managed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Martin, are you happy with that? You don't want to ask a supplementary, you're happy? Uh, no, no, that's quite comprehensive, Victor. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, I agree. It was a comprehensive answer. Um, Councillor Pat Hay, you had the next question, but in my view, I think Victor has, in a sense, answered your question. Are you, are you happy that we proceed on? Um, yeah, just to ask um, whether, you know, I mean, have we considered uh, home vaccinations? I just my question was about elderly or still a bit yeah. reluctant to go out yeah. uh, still a bit reluctant to visit doctor's surgery would we be offering you know home vaccinations that's all yeah victor would you like to come in on that muted yeah uh, as part of our system wide uh, arrangement and discussion uh, there are provision for um, patients who for for any reason cannot be able to come to the GP practice. Uh, the our community nurses will go out and, and, and offer that through the arrangement with the, with the GP practice. Uh, so so that that is in, in place. Thank you. That takes us to Councillor Phil Cole's questions. I think you have two. 
Yes, the uh, hi. The um, paragraph 11 refers to the um, Yorkshire and Humber measles and rubella elimination strategy um, and suggests that the, the uptake of first and second doses to 95%. Now, given that we're at 89.4 and 84 point something um, percent at the moment, um, what does the strategy do that we didn't do in the past that will enable you to reach over half of the missed people and everybody who previously had the vaccine? Thank, thank you, Phil. So the, the national strategy uh, has got uh, as its ambition uh, those under five, but also uh, the older cohort who haven't had opportunity to, to uh, take up the, um, the vaccination to be able to achieve the 95% coverage. Uh, the other second aspect is um, what you would call as audit to understand uh, to, to understand more about um, uh, why some of the uh, people are not taking up uh, those vaccination. Uh, and, and the fourth element is around how, how evidence is shared with the relevant professionals to be able to, um, uh, to equip them uh, and support in, in, in the work required. So along, along that line, of, uh, work, uh, line uh, what we've done was uh, the work around um, doing, doing local audit to understand uh, some of the challenges in the system related to immunization. Uh, particularly the childhood immunization. We have undertaken um, uh, a survey with, with the practices. So uh, NHS England working together with, with uh, our public health team and then uh, the CCG colleagues, we design. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a national tool um, which help us to understand the detail. Some of them are to do with the logistic of um, organizing um, the uh, the process of sending out invitation to to, to children uh, for the vaccination. Um, it, it's it's a bit of the, the detailed mechanism of how to do that and the challenges practices face. So we uh, that that was undertaken, um, and and we are using that results to kind of help uh, build further action plan. And obviously, because COVID has come in. Um, just when we were kind of trying to work out the plan for how we need to take that forward based on that audit work. Um, so, so that's what we are intending to do. We, we do know that um, there has been challenges uh, around uh, uptake, uh, and some of them may be to do with um, uh, the, the myths and attitudes of parents um, in order <coughs> taking those out. And that's where the issue of the evidence and information come in, where we need to ensure that um, uh, when disappointment are sent, uh, the message about reinforcing why it is important uh, is, is, really, uh, is really key. You will remember many years of uh, the issue about um, uh, MMR, the controversy, the link with autism and that kind of things. Um, so it is still important to dispel those, those myths. Um, and, and some maybe is having 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 those. It's been kind of dis, uh, dismissed by the, uh, the professional bodies. Um, so addressing those myths and encouraging parents uh, of the importance of uh, the uptake of MMR is is really key. We we have, as I was saying, we we have um, uh, a comprehensive um, plan for immunization, and we bring all the partners together uh, on a regular basis. Uh, chaired by um, NHS England, and it's basically to look at some of those logistics. And in addition to that, uh, we have also a quarterly meeting, which is which is um, coordinated by NHS England. Uh, they call it Screening and Immunization Overview um, Group. Uh, it's, it's to look at those logistics, the details. Uh, and, and as part of that, we also monitor what the uptake is on, on quarterly basis. Uh, we do acknowledge there are challenges, but that is a system to kind of help us to um, to, to monitor uh, uh, the, the uptake, but also undertake some of the action that is required. 
I don't know whether I've answered your question. Uh, yes, in in part, um, but it it leads really to my the second question, which was if you believe that you've got a comprehensive strategy for increasing uptake and doing a catch up for the missed generation of children who had a, either only partial vaccination or none at all. Um, how do we explain the fact that for the last three years, the percentage um, receiving the MMR has fallen year on year in Doncaster long before COVID-19? And now we have the further challenge of COVID-19, but it looks like our past record was pretty poor. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, the, 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 the challenge um, that we've got uh, is fairly not only a, a local challenge, it's a national challenge. If you look at what the, um, the national England rate is, you will find that um, uh, even at, 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 at the national level, uh, the target, uh, it's quite challenging to achieve that target. So um, it's both a national, a national and a local, a local, a local issue. Um, we need to do something. You're right in, in the sense um, from what we've been doing uh, in the past. Uh, the, the survey that we have undertaken, um, which I described, uh, we haven't done it in such a way to, under, to understand uh, um, what we needed to do. So I think that is that is a, sta a starting point, and the action plan that. Uh, flows from that uh, is is really key to help us turn the corner, and and this brings us to something that we have been quite keen from public health point of view. Uh, in order to to make improvement, uh, it's important to kind of learn from the best performing practices as well as um, those practices that are struggling, because um, there may be systems that. The best performing practices, uh, how they organize things, uh, other practices can can learn from, and 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 that is kind of a supportive role uh, in terms of encouraging performance across lifting performance uh, ac across the board, but also um, those those areas that have got low uptake are supported to increase their performance much more rapidly, and and. Uh, CCG and NHS England have been kind of looking at how how those practices can be supported, those at the lower end who have been struggling. Because amidst those variations, the average hides a lot of things. There are practices that are doing really very well in Doncaster. And, and it is uh, the learning from those that we can be able to apply and spread across. Uh, you are right, COVID has interrupted things, uh, but we may need to pick that up. I know that it is a challenge, uh, but during COVID period, uh, the message has been that uh, immunization program has not stopped. That that's that's the message that we've been sending out, despite the COVID situation. Uh, Chair, if I could just uh, move on to the the related question, or do you want to do your question? He may, but I would just like to come in there um, because, um, Victor, you were touching a moment or two ago uh, talking about, you know, the current uptake of, um, of, of early childhood and And I've been told anecdotally that it's actually, um, from a parental point of view, um, a dreadful experience in that you get um, very often an approximate time to attend a surgery and then you will join a very long socially distanced queue of um, parents and carers with with babies who have no access to anywhere to sit and feed a child they have no access to toilet facilities they have no access to baby change facilities and they're therefore um in some instances it, you know quite inordinate amounts of time um and so i just kind of give you that as a as a, as just one anecdotal observation you know and in the context of the fact you know I hold up this this paper and you know there's so much on here that's amber relating to 2018 2019 i can't help but feel very fearful for where we are going to be um you know when the data comes out appertaining to this period you know i really uphold some of the the kind of the the, the concerns that Councillor Phil Cole has shared and uh, you know want to say to you that 
yeah, um, I think it's something that this panel will 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 want to look at again because it's so fundamental to the health and well-being of of of, of, of this generation of children. Um, yeah, I, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, it's practices are trying to balance the issue of safety. Yes, um, and obviously also ensuring that um, uh, the children that needed to be vaccinated are vaccinated. And, and it is a challenge that um, I will be taking back to the um, the uh, committee, the group um, in Doncaster, to to ensure that we 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 ensure that um, the challenge, the two challenges we've got about balancing safety, and also ensuring um, coverage, is is really a priority on on, on our agenda. Uh, it's it's not an easy task, but I think I take I take um, both your points. Um, with, with the COVID, it's added a little bit of uh, challenges to the to the system, uh, but we are conscious about the the importance of ensuring that um, um, our our children are vaccinated uh, and, and achieve the, the highest possible uptake we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Would you like to come in with your further question now? Um, well, did you want to ask your um, your staff question first, Chair? Yes. <laughs> um, in previous uh, years, Victor, you've come and commented to us about how we have immunised our own staff against flu and the take up of that. I just wondered, can you tell us how is that going? Because obviously in the context of the other threat from COVID, we're very keen to ensure that um, our staff team members, uh, you know, right across the board, um, access uh, standard flu vaccine. Yeah. I think our own uh, staff vaccination had gone very well uh, in uh, when we compared the past um, couple of years. So it's about several years. Public health team have been um, uh, offering flu vaccination for staff. We have explored different model. Um, and, and last year, what we did was um, we offered the in-house um, flu vaccination. Uh, but commission and external provider, but they, they offered um, flu vaccination uh, within the building. Uh, and, and we had about um, uh, five, 600 uh, staff who, uh, who took up the, the vaccination. Now we, we targeted it based on people who are considered as critical for business continuity and who interact with um, uh, members uh, of the public, kind of frontline staff. So it's just kind of two basic criteria. Uh, and, and we've kind of approached it through the managers, uh, staff who meet those criteria, if they could uh, let us know and, uh, and, and we arrange it that way. Uh, it did work very well. Um, this year, what uh, we have done was we assessed the COVID situation because a lot of people are, are asked to work from home. Uh, we thought, um, it would be quite challenging. We we met we met with the, our HR uh, people to to, uh, to discuss the situation, and we concluded that um, we need to approach a different model. So this year we are we 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 have um, again followed the same approach, uh, but the advice also we got from our director system. Anybody who wanted to to have it can have it. Uh, so, so we kind of open it a little bit wider, uh, and we we are offering through community pharmacies. So there's a, uh, a system where staff can book in uh, the, the range of community pharmacies. They can uh, they can book onto it, and then can can get access it. We will, we can monitor online who has booked it. Uh, they would have they will mon they will they will have um, uh, work email email. For us to get assurance that there are actually not uh, other other people, um, so uh, that 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 is actively being uh, finalised now, uh, and and we have over two thousand staff who express interest. So it's um, um, three times what we used to three times what was last year. Um, so we we, we are working uh, towards uh, implementing that. It should be kind of really pretty pretty much uh, around now okay thank you thank you um councillor phil Cole, i will bring you in now with your question oh thanks chair the um 
In relation to the flu vaccination programme, you, your report, paragraph 21, refers to eight practices where immunisation rates saw a drop off of 20% in uptake. Um, what stands to the commissioners? Uh, take on that? I mean, do they reduce the funding to these practices? Do they um, slap them on the wrist? Do they have a, a catch-up strategy? Do they discipline them? What's the, what's the, um, what word am I searching for, Chair? What's the, um, uh, the, 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 the stick as Hello. well as the carrots? Because they, they're paid to do this. So what's the um, downside for them if they fail to deliver? So uh, it is NHS England that has got responsibility in terms of commissioning uh, this program. So uh, they get paid for um, the delivery of the of the of the services. So um, obviously that is linked to um, the financial bit of the uh, of the incentive. If they achieve a certain threshold, they'll they'll get paid some um, um, some in, in, in incentive. From the quality improvement point of view, uh, it's, it's really what I described earlier in terms of more of support, um, uh, learning from one another, uh, as opposed to coming. Uh, I mean, the, the one angle from the commissioning side, um, NHS England as the commissioner has got that leverage through the through the, the, the financial uh, uh, aspect. But as a system, is really, uh, for example, from public health is. It's about how we can be able to support uh, support the, this group of uh, practices to uh, increase increase their uptake, uh, and, and some of them are, are fairly um, in a challenging situation. Uh, one example of um, a pilot that that was undertaken uh, was one one practice, the Bans practice uh, in town. And, and the GP has been very helpful uh, to, to work with us as part of our health inequality working group. And, and the pilot, what they've done was they've taken 10% of their population who are, are in the deprived uh, part of the border use, using uh, the indices of deprivation. And, and the approach was um, to look at the reason why uh, uptake of of services among those 10% can be quite poor. Some of them um, uh, could be issue of transport, like could be single parents, and they may be struggling. And instead of limiting appointment for uh, the normal appointment for seven minutes or 10 minutes, they would be a little bit flexible if, say, those individuals come a bit late for appointment, um, so so that so that they they, they are not disadvantaged uh, as far as those uh, those. Uh, uh, services are concerned, and that might lead to um, coming uh, uptake of, of of flu vaccination. Uh, it could be other other form of preventive service that uh, are offered through GP practice, and, <coughs> and that was considered uh, the, the, the pilot of that was really uh, successful in the sense uh, very positive um, in how how it's kind of come across, and it is those kind of example that really would want to kind of learn and support. Uh, practices to adapt, and and some of them is also to do with um, uh, how to engage how how to engage with those uh, families and individuals uh, in um, engage in, in in helping them take up the services. Most often, maybe a letter or a telephone call. Now, the approach might need to be slightly different. Uh, why some people may not respond to a, a letter uh, or a telephone because they may not be either available or they may not call back. So it's a combination of those approaches. That's why I said um, it's important to learn from some of the practice in the system that have done it very well. Uh, that could be uh, replicated uh, wi wider in the system, particularly for, for those practices that, um, that are not uh, doing so well. The key thing to note is each individual practice are like sovereign, um, sovereign, they consider themselves as sovereign, so they don't, technically, they don't want to be told how to do things. They could do things as they want. Now, um, yes, they are sovereign, but in terms of learning, we learn from each other. Uh, there may, th may be things that they're doing, but there may be things that they could learn. 
So it is more about the learning culture from one another and a supportive one. Uh, from public health point of view, it's really more support offer. And part of that support is um, uh, we use data to be able to show, well, this is, this is where your practice is and this is where everybody else is. Now, that is a very good tool for reflection uh, because that is a very hard evidence to say, mm, uh, is there anything we can do and work together uh, on this? And I think that approach has been quite uh, uh, acceptable for quite a lot of people because we've taken the approach of uh, uh, a, a, friend, a friendly, uh, supportive, rather than um, uh, a stake approach. Uh, thank you. Um, if I may, Chair, um, it, wouldn't one of the learning points be of this that a GP-led vaccination strategy doesn't work? I mean, wouldn't it be better to deliver dose two of MMR vaccines in schools instead of um, in pra practices one-to-one -one appointments and stuff? And as most of these GP practices delegate the vaccinations to nurses anyway, the yeah. presence of the doctor is completely incidental. Um, why aren't they delivered in community centres or um, whatever by community nurses and just have mass vaccination sessions? Why would we make this the responsibility of individual GPs who seem to miss 20% or more of our target audience? I, I don't get it at all. Part, part of it is the historical and, lo and logistical uh, issue. Um, when I was a kid, we did it at school. There was yeah. a community nurse who injected every child at school. And in America, in certain states, you can't even go to school if you haven't had the statutory vaccinations. So, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's doable, but it probably needs um, some decision uh, higher up uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the government system to be able to kind of that policy shift. Uh, okay. But um, at the moment, it's the GP that holds the, the, the system in terms of ordering the vaccine itself. Um, but we know in schools it's, it's starting to happen for, for the flu vaccination. It is split between schools and a bit of the uh, uh, GP, GP practice. So um, the younger group gets it from the GP practice. But also, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the older adults do get from GP practice. But uh, some children get it now through school system, um, so uh, it's it's quite it's required a bit of thinking and the logistics uh, associated with that to make to make it happen. Uh, particularly here, five years old, they will be in the reception. That kind of thing, maybe something that uh, need to be explored. Um, because you're right, uh, the, the concern of uh, uptake, um, particularly the second dose, uh, being quite low, and it's across the, across the board, not only. Uh, in terms of, of, of nationally, yeah. uh, but we we still need to at, at present we still need to work with our GP to see how we can be able to address some of those challenges. And in Thank the long you, term, Victor. in the long term, those suggestions are part of things that could be put into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering whether in order to capture some of this, it might be appropriate that we, uh, we we do some work to generate a letter following this consideration of this issue um, and, uh, you know, perhaps invite Mayor Ros Jones to write on behalf of Doncaster um, highlighting, you know, our, our concerns around the extent to which we can stay on track with immunisations and whether um, in this, uh, you know, scenario we're now faced with, we need a, we need to embrace a different approach um, that will deliver more. Um, I'm getting some nods on that, so I, agree. Um, yeah. I think yeah. Caroline will we'll take that, we'll make that yeah. as a, a, a as a recommendation. Okay, yes, please. That. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Councillor Laney May Ball, you have uh, you, you have a couple of questions. May I bring you in now to ask your questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's just regarding the screening programme. So Donkers has achieved national standards in all of the main screening groups. Um, the questions regarding what will be the impact of uh, COVID-19 in terms of cancellation and delays uh, of the screening on our targets? Yeah. Um, so what happened in the early stage, uh, they did pause the screening programme, uh, but now as things 
um, are coming towards recovery, although we still have this anxiety about um, the increasing number of, of cases. What we are seeing is um, NHS England is asking um, um, the system NHS to kind of um, start um, putting up services uh, as it used to be in, in a safe in a safe in a safe way. So um, and and that includes uh, screening program. Um, there are obviously challenges in terms of um, some of some of the uh, screening program and, and processes, particularly um, as 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 they require quite um, an environment that is COVID secure and approach which is safe as well. Um, they are working to, uh, towards getting ensuring that um, uh, everybody who needs to have those uh, are safely uh, invited back to the, to, the, to, the, to the system. It's obviously early days. Uh, there has been a, the COVID has put a bit of delay in the system, uh, but uh, we hope that um, they, they would put back the services um, uh, back for those who, um, who who needs them who are on the uh, on the target. Thank you, Victor. Thanks. Yeah, are you happy with that, Lainey? Yes, yeah, I am. Thank you. Okay, so if you want to go ahead now with the next question around it, moves us on actually onto the topic of, um, of air pollution. So please go ahead, Lainey. Thank you, Chair. So, just regarding the pollution level of the A630 mark, it's been, it's been referred to uh, before. So, how, how far from the road? Does the poor air quality extend? And has monitoring been done near the residential properties? Yeah, um, just limited uh, studies uh, I'm aware of regarding uh, how far um, the pollution extends. But generally, to kind of uh, the immediate vicinity along the road. Uh, where um, or the houses houses on the on the on the main road tend to have the the, the, uh, the main the main impact, um, but houses beyond that uh, that's kind of limited. Obviously, uh, if you look at the dispersion, the, the impact would be less if if, if uh, the far the further you go from houses that are near near the side. So, um, in in brief, what I would say is that. Um, um, Many stipulation is based on uh, houses uh, close to the road. Um, those that are far farther uh, will find out the details in terms of how far <coughs> there is, and we've not looked it in, in in such a uh, uh, in, in more detail how far, for example, uh, from the roadside um, uh, will the impact of pollution be be greatest. But from what I know. Uh, the nearer the nearer the houses, the more the impact. So, in situation we are talking about really is houses that are more close to to the roadside. Uh, I wonder you. whether whether uh, Shannon, uh, whether yes. you've got anything to to add. Yes, uh, I have some numbers that I've been able to get from our pollution control colleagues. Um, so, in mm -hmm. regard to the mar, um, the Nitrogen dioxide concentrations, uh, they've been measured at one metre from the curb, three metres from the curb and 18 metres from the curb. So that doesn't specify how close any of that gets to houses. It will obviously depend on where the houses are in relation to the curb distance. Um, and I can actually, uh, the, all of those results are published annually in a, in a report and I can provide a link and the specific numbers. If people would like to see it now rather than listen to me read it out, I can pop it into the chat. Um, yep. So, that, and then it could go into perhaps the minutes for this. So, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you will you. be unsurprised to learn that the farther you get from the curb, the lower the concentration. To put it in sort of non <laughs> non scientific language, um, and I think just to reiterate that yeah, obviously it's a, a significant. Harm. There was a 2019 Public Health England did review that did this. That it's significant in terms of coronary heart disease, stroke, respiratory disease, lung cancer, and asthma. So I think um, you can see some of the impacts, the results for households in terms of the the health effects and the illnesses that people develop. And that's there's disparity there. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Phil, you had a question about the um, the health impacts, didn't you, of the pollution? Do you want to come in now? Yes, the um, I, I assume that the Public Health England figures that attribute a proportion of all mortality to air pollution, um, uh, and they they allocate Doncaster a figure. I assume that is a kind of is that a patient by patient statistic or is that some algorithm that's making a prediction? Um, because if someone has COPD or a chronic lung condition in Doncaster, history tells you it was probably related to industrial causes rather than air pollution. Mm. Therefore, how do they um, how do they attribute the mortality to air particulates? And you mentioned those causes of death. They sound to me very much like the same causes of death that a lot of our industrial um, population experience. Uh, yes, that is a model they use. They've calculated that's a model they use, and it does apply to uh, local local area. And that's kind of overlap in terms of those those diseases uh, that Anon talked about. Um, so the, the respiratory, respiratory disease like um, uh, asthma, uh, like uh, and, 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 and uh, conditions such as um, uh, heart, heart problems are part of those uh, mm. those group of conditions, uh, and it is based on uh, some some uh, formula that is worked out nation nationally. And but that was in a way my. That comes to my question, Chair, because if you look at lots of the towns and villages in Doncaster, air quality is extremely good. Most people don't live in Mar, or they don't live on Trafford Way in Doncaster. They live in leafy villages, even mining villages are very green. The air quality in a place like Rosington is very good, actually. So, but the people dying of those lung conditions and so on, are living in those villages where air quality is very good, but they have a history of poor illness because of their industrial heritage. So, um, or, or other lifestyle issues, smoking rates or whatever. So how do you attribute it to air quality? I mean, uh, when you, when you, um, when you reach to the end product of death, um, it can be quite difficult to untangle uh, in some of these situations, that uh, the cause is one, you will find uh, quite a number of uh, causes they interact with one another and they produce that. And I think they've taken that into consideration. You are right, for some of this, smoking is a big, um, uh, is number one big, big um, uh, cause, particularly we know for respiratory Ill, uh, illnesses, uh, for cancer, uh, and for heart disease, smoking is a big one. But we also know, based on emerging evidence, that uh, air quality, poor air quality, contribute to to, to 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 those situation as well. So it is interaction of of multiple factors. When we are looking at the uh, death or, or mortality figure, uh, there, there is rarely one thing that is the, the major cause. You you will find for some of them, they they would indicate the main the main um, cause of death. In death certificate, it's only very recently that um, I think in London they've kind of highlighted that somebody the cause of this was air, air, air pollution. But in the past, that hasn't happened before. Uh, it is basically recognition of that this individual had lived uh, on a main road, um, walked to school, or uh, when it's highly polluted, and and uh, suffered uh, asthma attack because of that. So that's kind of rare, but it doesn't mean that um, air quality does not contribute to making situation worse. Uh, or, or over time, it puts individual at high risk. Yeah, understood. Thank you. May I bring in uh, Councillor Cynthia Ransom and then Shannon uh, Kennedy would like to speak. Cynthia. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for that. And I appreciate the questions that have been asked about the air pollution. Um, Ma and Hittleton, of course, are in my ward and I am working quite hard with a group there regarding the air pollution. We seem to be doing a lot of measuring and I think for members that know actually Hittleton particularly, it's virtually like a tunnel. So the air quality is particularly bad there. Now we've been measuring this for a long time now, 
What, what exactly are we doing with these readings and where do we move forward with it? Uh, so our, our, our team um, in the air quality uh, um, unit in the council um, are identifying this hotspot uh, and, and they are um, monitoring it. They're not only monitoring, there are some associated action plan that sits underneath, uh, under, underneath, underneath those um, uh, monitoring figures. It's not only the, the, the monitoring. The monitoring help us to see uh, the progress we, we are making, uh, but there are uh, action uh, in the report. You will note some kind of um, uh, action uh, plan um, to try to, to address, to mitigate some of those um, um, air, air, airport pollution um, but identified areas. The, the, the detail are in um, the, the report has got some bit of the detail in terms of um, uh, uh, what what has happened um, and and what uh, the the teams are trying to, to do over over time. Uh, let me try to see um, does the section chum that we highlighted about some of the air quality uh, responses. I'm trying to locate um, a slide that um, uh, we. Yeah, so uh, for example, the work uh, partnering with, with Bansley Council to, to deliver uh, eco business uh, driving on, on, on those companies that employ drivers using own vehicles for, for work purposes. Uh, and, and the work around refurbishment and modernization of the council air quality units, including the provision of the, uh, the, the, the monitors, the air quality monitors, uh, the anti idling messages uh, that is being shared with school. I know this is not specific to, uh, to uh, the, the area you, you are referring to here. Uh, and, and, and work around the um, clean air uh, day. Um, and the work related to the Doncaster Active Travel Alliance. Um, there is appendix around around uh, those action plan. Uh, the dedicated work, uh, dedicated uh, working officer and active travel uh, auditor providing insight and systematic approach. Uh, so those are some of the uh, uh, initiatives highlighted. Uh, I would welcome any any thought. Uh, if you think that, um, or from the group that you are uh, you are linked with, um, whether there is anything that you think um, needed to be done, and the group is not picking that, and we could pick that up uh, with with the with the alliance. Cynthia, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I can I just make the point, Victor? When we were yeah. In our pre-meeting, we were looking at, you know, at this particular table of information that you supplied us as part of the documentation for this meeting. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, some of us were a little bit concerned around um, the extent to which so much of this is dependent on funding that we haven't sourced. And we also appear to be kind of flagging things up and, and, and being pleased about them, but they're not very impactful so the example that i would give and and uh, you know you've declared all of this it's not going to be news to you i'm not thinking that i'm telling you something you don't know but yeah. we talk in here about this um th this scheme for um eco star taxi scheme um but even you're telling us you know there's no uptake in doncaster um and <laughs> Now we know obviously we're in the midst of a, of a public health emergency and your focus of attention cannot be on this. Um, but I think what it kind of said to me was that at, at some point in the future, we are going to need to take this up uh, with, you know, with gusto and we're going to be moving from a relatively low base point okay. if, um, you know, our action plan is is basically saying that We've only got one high impact measure, um, the rest are, are low impact measures. And um, against virtually all of these measures, there's very little that we have got um, to cite as, as something that's that's tangible and um, that we feel we can achieve. 
Um, and, and likewise, um, your report, you know, we have the, uh, the lovely picture and the good news story around what happened at, at West End Primary School that, that, that we can feel pleased about. But, you know, we've got, um, what is it now, uh, approaching 150 or more schools in our borough. Uh, you know, and this is but one. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, in kind of in, in, in summary, what we would want to say is we know this can't be your priority, um, yeah. but we, we we have a measure of concern. Yeah. Would that be, would that seem fair? Would that seem fair to you? Yeah, I think yeah. that's fair. And it's something I can be, we can be able to take back to the uh, Alliance, the, tra the Active Travel Alliance. Um, so they are there really uh, to, to help us um, uh, ensure that those actions are translated. Uh, they are not only um, there uh, as aspiration, uh, they, they are there to be, um, to be delivered. Uh, and, and, and unless, unless it is dependent on something, uh, something just like funding, as you say, uh, and, and again, we need to know how to progress with those fundings, funding situation. But, but you're right, there are certain things that depend on funding, but I think there are certain things concrete that we can do within our, our control. Thank you. We do want to continue talking about active travel and Councillor Cole has a question, but I can see Councillor Ransom has a hand raised, so I'll bring her in now. No, sorry. Sorry, oh. my mistake. Sorry. OK, OK. Thank you. So it's over to you, Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, really, following on from uh, uh, your um, uh, your observations, um, the uh, is there any data to show the um, impact of any of these messages or campaigns on modal shift? Are there actually fewer people travelling by car? Is there any evidence that more children are walking to school? Um, the, uh, the data, your, your um, page 15 of the report observes that um, 12,000 people live within 20 minutes walk of work and yet don't walk to work. Now, that I can think of lots of reasons why they wouldn't walk to work, um, because it's um, cold and wet, or because they have to drop off a child at childcare on the way to, to, to um, work, or drop children at school on the way to work, or collect, and whatever. And I can think of a, lots of good reasons mm. why, if I was a parent, I wouldn't walk to work. Yeah. And there are 12,000 people who, don't seem to follow any of the messages or advice, which brings me to the point the chair was making about impact. Um, are all these lovely messages, uh, children doing lovely patterns in the um, on their fields saying we love clean air to be photographed from, from a drone, is that all uh, completely without any real impact um, at all? Um, you know, it, is there any evidence that we're having any impact? Uh, none of our previous strategies appear to have affected these 12,000 people. Good point, uh, um, Phil, on, 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 on the issue about the impact of some of these initiatives. Uh, they, they do need to be obviously uh, monitored and, and measured. We do know that uh, from evidence point of view, um, they do have impact on um, not only the, the, the air quality but the, the health of, of, the, of the people uh, in in a number of ways, uh, and it's down to the strategy. What what is put in place um, as alternative to our travel alternative? I, I know some schools are active in, in this, so if if uh, measures to to enable um, uh, parents. <coughs> To be able, if, if they live near within a walking distance, they can be able to bring their children home. That means less less um, less car uh, on the road. You you are absolutely right in the sense um, some of those decisions based on um, what is easy uh, in terms of enabling people to take those kind of options. Now it may be a combination of things. Uh, could be weather. Could be also road road situation layout. Some may want to come by, uh, maybe, um, maybe uh, walk or cycle. Um, is the road layout uh, enabling enabling that to, to, to happen? 
Um, so there's a combination thing that that makes it attractive, and I think our, our challenge as a system is um, to make sure that um, it is easier for people to choose the alternative, which is a much, much more healthy option, than to revert back to um, what would be uh, considered as um, um, uh, contributing to the to the air uh, pollution challenge. And, and hence this idea about uh, if, if people live nearer, they could be able to walk, and in the process they can, uh, there's a lot of uh, A for, for the health, physical health benefit, but also they can make um, uh, linkage with one another. Parents can make linkage with one another in terms of interaction, so it's, it's much more positive. And over time, when they get used to it, the children will also uh, enjoy it. So uh, again, um, in terms of impact, um, there are uh, a number of ways how we could be able to feature that, and, but it will require a bit of the both the hard data and then the qualitative bit of the data, and that needs to be built up as part of the, the program itself. Um, in terms of how it is evaluated, it can be evaluated um, through through the, the qualitative aspect of um, it may not be all schools, but at least um, some schools but built into the process how um, the perception of both schools and, and parents uh, how they feel it is happening and what the barriers are taking that into consideration to continue improve it is, is key to it obviously in the long term is uh, we can be able to pick it up in terms of uh, some of the uh, conditions which we know are associated with, with air pollution and, and, and they manifest through through the NHS system. Uh, and then we can pick that data through uh, Public Health England. They do collect to us a dashboard of um, conditions that are linked to, uh, to the air quality. Uh, for example, uh, childhood asthma and uh, the prevalence and attack and that kind of thing. We can pick that information from um, Public Health England uh, data. But there is uh, another bit that we can do, local intelligence, that we can be able to gather, and that needs to be built as part of the project itself, action plan. Uh, thank you, Victor. I, I appreciate that your, uh, your trust in data and your the importance of intelligence. My concern is whether any of the data or the messages influences behavior and changes what people do. <laughs> yeah. um, a very simple, good example seems to me that if you, um, a few couple of years ago, I saw at Branton St. Wilfred's, they have a thing called the WOW scheme. I, I don't know what it stands for, but basically all the children are dropped off by their parents at a local pub car park a couple of hundred yards from school, and then the children all walk to school, and then the parents pick them up from the pub car park, and therefore there isn't. Uh, a, a massive congestion of cars around the school. Yeah. Now, that kind of good practice, one might say, we could have standardised across the borough. Lots of schools could have done that, and and yet we don't. And and so most schools, it's a fight outside of the school every day as cars queue up trying to get as close to the school gate as they can. And so we don't even embed good practice in just the simple act of parents dropping off children in schools. No, I agree. Thank you. Can I just bring Councillor Haith in here? She's she's really keen to come in at this point. Yeah, one, one of my residents asked if uh, Doncaster Council had considered st street uh, closures for schools. Uh, and she got back to me to tell me that um, we've been successful in getting funding from DEFRA uh, through the Sheffield City region. So they're, they're going to engage with schools, families and communities around school street closures to see whether it's feasible. So, and also um, have events around uh, walking to school, cycling and scooting in a safe environment. So Doncaster are on with it. You know, it's just um, like we said before um, in, in the report that lots of our uh, schemes are, uh, are reliant on funding and it looks like you know in the report from page 61 to 64 a lot of it has ceased a lot of it you know is is out of our grasp 
So I would ask that obviously if we are trying to get these schemes up and running, that we write to the Minister of Transport uh, via the Mayor uh, to say, you know, we, we want to do this, we need the funding to sort of kickstart it, um, you know, can we get the funding off the ground? Thank you, Pat. I'm very happy to take that as a, as a second recommendation from this uh, from this panel meeting. Um, yes. Shannon, did you want to come in? I think you had your hand raised a moment ago. Just to add to um, some of the information we've had that um, it's, there is information on take up of individual services and activities in relation to the active travel work. Um, Kerry Peruzza, the, the commissioner, will have that kind of information and if uh, that's something that would be useful to try to get in a more formal response if we've got time to go and get it we can look into that but um it was also that I had some additional information that I'd been given about um in relation to that funding around the school streets um just that yeah there's quite a lot of uh, preliminary work that needs to go into that to understand for example which sites may or may not be appropriate for that what the unintended consequences of doing that might be. So it's fortunate that this fund, this particular funding has been secured to start to do some of that work to understand sensible ways to implement things that can be sustainable and not sort of small pieces of, of work. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's that's a part of it. And then there's going to need to be a lot of work around community engagement to get people to actually want to take these things up. And that's another thing that I know um, our colleague Claire Henry, who provided some of this background information to me, has said that is that is an area of work, is really understanding some of the, not just infrastructural, but kind of cultural and behavioural barriers to why people do or do not take up active travel. So hopefully some of the positive measures we've seen as a result of COVID and lockdown and people being kind of afraid to go on buses and things will be that there's more of an attitudinal openness to the concept and an ability to push from the other side, like writing to the Department of Transport, who seem interested now in potentially supporting around funding, try and um, have a more comprehensive approach, um, including things like the existing active travel officers that can support schools and then moving that on to these bigger schemes like the, uh, the school streets. I think maybe it might be appropriate to consider a, a member's seminar around that issue, particularly schools. So many councils are... Um, uh, uh, governors uh, of, of, of schools, I think uh, there could be potential there for us to um, to give support in that area and uh, keep yeah, a focus yeah, yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, looking at my questions, have you got another question, Phil, that you want to ask here? Sorry. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I was saying, no, I'm done. You're done. Thanks very you're much. Done. That's good. OK, thank you. Uh, and any anyone else? No. Hmm. Oh, yes. Councillor Gibbons. Uh, 50 pence fine, Chair, for the mobile phone going off for longer than seven seconds. Accepted. Accepted. <laughs> uh, it was just really, I've been listening. Uh, you're very, uh, very um, interested about all the, all the stuff going on. So thank you, Victor uh, and Shannon, for all that uh, detail. It was just something that's come up. It's not really related to uh, the air pollution or the immunisation, etc. It's just uh, one of uh, our local residents has reported that a couple of days ago, her elderly mother was, um, she sadly had a fall uh, in, in the Asda. She's almost 80. And she went to Mexpra Montague, uh, minor injuries, and was turned away. Um, and I had to go to Rotherham Hospital and wait five hours, which was very distressing. And I just wondered, in light of where we are with the COVID uh, response, um, I, I have fired an email off actually to Richard Parker not too long ago. But yeah. what is there a new policy about um, treating uh, over 65s at the uh, minor injuries? What what did um, the the detail in terms of um, who to be aware? Uh, I'll find out from, uh, from from the trust itself, but I think um, they have a system in, in place in terms of certain condition, in terms of the, the, the A&E um, uh, re referral, where, where they need to be dealt with because of the COVID secure situation. 
So I don't know the detail about this particular um, station, uh, but um, we will be happy to investigate the why. If you, uh, I know you've written already. Yeah. Written already. Um, we can pick that up to find out uh, the circumstances and, and give further explanation, if that's okay. Yes, that that would be great. Thanks, Victor. I'll actually I'll I'll forward the email to you so you you're yeah. in the loop. Um, it is just concerning because I know that obviously when she's she's 78 years of age and she lives in Mexborough, just literally down the road from the Montague. So it's something to uh, to obviously raise in terms of any other um, incidents. Yeah, if you forward it to me, uh, we can pick that up and provide uh, a further detail in terms of what happened and 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 the why. Excellent. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. So I think all that remains now is to say to you, uh, Victor and uh, Shannon, thank you very much indeed for uh, your time with us this morning. Thank you for the report you've prepared and for answering our questions so openly and honestly. We have appreciated that. And I think we've all found this morning's discussion really, uh, re really interesting, really interesting. Yeah. And we also want to um, commend you and thank you for all the work your department is doing in this current crisis. Uh, you know, we are incredibly grateful to you. Um, I'm sure it's been very stressful and very difficult indeed. But um, on behalf of our residents as councillors, we all want to say, uh, you know, we are grateful. Thank you very, very much and uh, keep up the good work, keeping us all safe. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your questions. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. So if you, 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 you may leave us now, Victor and Shannon, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, do you want to talk to us about the work plan now? Yes. Um, well, I'm just going to note first, just to sum up the recommendations from the last yeah. item. Yes. So we've got two letters, uh, basically, well, two recommend recommendations to us that letters uh, be written uh, or via the mayor. Um, one about uh, to the Minister of Transport and the other was about the take up of immunisations. And then the third thing was um, member seminar around um, getting schemes up and running around active travel, uh, that area. So just that correct? I just yes. wanted to check that was correct. OK. Yeah. Um, right. So on to the work plan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and Members of the panel just want to turn the cameras off because I think this will help increase the um, the image you'll see. And then I'll, I'll just check in a minute that you're OK. You can see it. Right. Can you, are you OK seeing what's on my screen, which I'm just scrolling down now? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Good. OK, right. I'm just going to scroll down to get to the the work plan item. Sorry, it's longer then. We're nearly there. There we go. Right. OK, I'll see if I can just um, take that down. Right. Is that OK? Yes. Right, OK. So so I'll just go, scroll down a bit further to the next meeting, which with the second column along here. So this is our next meeting. So it's on the Thursday, 26th of November, 2020 in the morning. And this will be around winter planning partnership plan. And that'll include hospital discharge to care homes. And then as a result of the pandemic, we've added track and trace and the, the latest COVID-19 position. Uh, we'll also use that as an opportunity to pick up on some, some issues from last year's uh, report. So we'll, um, we'll communicate them to the panel. Following November meeting, uh, the one in January, we've got us around childhood obesity and get donkeys to move in uh, to include invite to DCLT. Um, and as we always say at the um, work planning stage, the, the work plan's like a moving fee. So, you know, it might be that something comes up um, later on in between these. So as we do, we'll keep communicating them to you. So going on to the forward plan, or oh, sorry, Chair, I don't know if you want, um, if any panel members have got any comment at this stage. No. 
Right. I just wanted to say that in the next meeting in November, oh, yeah. we'll have Richard Parker attending, won't we? And it will be the opportunity yeah. to take up with him some of the issues that we raised when we saw him a year ago. And then in particular, we were exceedingly concerned about the length of time ambulance crews were spending uh, queued up outside A&E. Yeah. Uh, yeah. waiting to be able to um, hand over patients um, and that was something that he acknowledged was an issue and he had a plan uh, to radically improve that so one of the things that we really need to pick <clears throat> up with him is what's happened albeit that of course um, everything changed in March with Covid but um, yeah yeah because it, it was at the beginning of this year we had an item around um the ambulance and changes to there's a hall but in Doncaster so that'll kind of pick up on that as well if I can recall correctly yes um so 18th of March um health protection assurance report so that's what you've had today an update of it it usually comes in March uh, but officers mentioned it was deferred that's why it's come later um so it looks like that'll have a more of a position around what's happened in light of Covid and again, you know, we might have more items on there. We have the suicide prevention plan as part of that. Um, I think suicide prevention was picked up as part of mental health earlier on. Um, but I kind of have a look at a look at what happened following that that item, if you'd like, the suicide prevention plan. Yes, please. Thank you. OK, right. I'll make a note of that. So I think there's a, a few things we just keep on the back burner. Sorry, <laughs> scrolling more down there and they'll uh, we'll populate that as we go along. So there's like adult safeguarding report and our dash accounts. So the forward plan, there's nothing specific for this panel that I could see. Mainly more like for OSMC. I can see what's coming up this, um, some other areas for other panels performance that goes to OSMC. So if there's anything in those reports, um, you know, I know members are always welcome to submit questions through the chair who is on OSMC. Uh, I think the other things to mention is the, the borough strategy, which will go to OSMC and they have their, they have relevant themes like Doncaster Caring, uh, which will pick up on some issues covered by this panel. And that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I don't know if there's any further comments, um, but that's basically the latest update on the forward plan and the work plan. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. I don't have any further comments. I, oh, Sean's got his hand up. Apologies, Chair, it's just up from earlier on, so uh, right. I'll take it down here. Yeah. OK, OK. So I think, colleagues, that concludes our morning's work and it has been quite a morning and it's been quite hard work, but I think it's been very fruitful and very purposeful. Um, I've enjoyed it. I trust that you have too. Definitely. Um, Thank you. So with that, we'll say good afternoon to one another and get on with the rest of the business of the day. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye